What's up, you rat bastards? It's your relatable YouTube friend John Ghoul here. Now, don't you hate it when your mother and father take away your PS4 just because you ran over your neighbor's dog with the lawnmower? Wow, don't you know people make mistakes? And doesn't it drive you mad when you're 45 years old and you bet your parents farm on a game of crabs, so now you have to put them in a home which has a lower rating than the Master of Disguise? Come on, people. I'm only human after all. And the worst is when you're trying to talk to them, but they're just too busy eating a guy. Not cool, Dad. Whoa, 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 what? Hey, Hannibal. This ain't your mama's- YouTube intro. Parents was a little horror movie released right before the turn of the decade, which undeservedly went under the radar. To sell you, I'll give you a brief synopsis. Taking place in the 1950s, a standard nuclear family moves to a new neighborhood where their son has trouble fitting in. His teachers think he's butt-fucking insane because he says weird things and he's having weird dreams where he tries out every politician's favorite pastime, bathing in blood. According to Nigel Farage, it does wonders for the pores. And taking a cue from Morrissey, he's an annoying-ass vegan, much to the dismay of his father, whose favorite show is The New Norm on Twitter TV. Uh, it was with classical music on the radio. Fucking pronoun! As the film goes on, the trouble boy starts to suspect that his parents are actually cannibals. Probably because he sees his dad cutting up bodies, but that could really mean anything. The film portrays a standard slice of Americana with a horrific twist. It wonderfully captures the white picket fence aesthetic with perfect costuming in the Spanish rock soundtrack. But when it's not just lynching and droning. What kind of place is this? It was directed by this man, who you probably recognize. Bob's Burgers. Burger. Wes Anderson puts him in a lot of his movies, as well as Christopher Guest mockumentaries. He's a great character actor, perfect when you need a real-life counterpart to Hans Molman. I know he's also a big fan of Cowboys, and as someone who has 100% of Red Dead 2, so is legally Arthur Morgan in real life, I can respect that. Wait, Bob, what are you doing? Bob? No one's gay for Mole Man. It makes me wonder how personal this movie is. Like, this man would have grown up around the time the movie took place, and doesn't this man just look like he had parental figures who had a taste for the rarest game meat? This movie's probably more true than Fargo, but not Looney Tunes back in action, because that movie really happened. Well, as it turns out, I'm secretly evil. <laughs> That's hillbibs for you. Pac-Man's a bad guy? I love this movie because of its unique comedic tone, especially for its time. There's plenty of ways to do horror comedy. You can make it campy, where the viewer doesn't really take the movie that seriously, or you can alternatively treat the horror almost entirely seriously and have humor derived from the characters. Or there's the Rob Zombie Eli Roth method, where all the characters say sex fuck tits every five seconds. Bart, you <laughs> asshole, it's not funny. <laughs> yes it is, you fucking slut. A loser type of geek and a slut! But parents' comedy is very absurdist and awkward, in a way that's very ahead of its time. It reminds me almost of those 10-minute Adult Swim infomercials, I'm sure you're aware of too many cooks or even unedited footage of a bear, where the comedy comes not from particular jokes, but just sticking to the odd premise while trying to take it as seriously as possible. They want this to feel almost like a cheesy sitcom with the over-the-top 50s mom, and ending with essentially the sitcom intro introducing everybody, but now coming off as menacing when you know these characters all tried to murder each other. Even the performances being so intentionally awkward almost remind me of something like Tim and Eric where they get random freaks off the street. Me so hungry. Bon appetit. To sum it up, the movie is essentially a full-length version of Spaghetti again. And trust me, that is high praise. You are making a glutton out of me. How do you make this? Actually, I got it off the side of a corn checks box. I don't believe that. It's true. I don't believe that. And instead of raisins, I use miniature marshmallows. Mmm. So good. Great job. Again, for such an odd premise, the performances really sell it. Mary Beth Hurt plays the mother Lily. Picture a typical 50s mom. She's attractive and is the size of an average human mother. Okay, what not that hard. Is... And Mary plays it to a T. A lot of the funniest moments come from her delivery. Ow! I can get out of here. Look at me when you're talking to me! Reminds me a lot of Laura Linney's performance in The Truman Show, but I dare say she even goes beyond it. It'd be easy to make Lily feel like an absurd caricature, but there is a level of reality which keeps her performance from being one note and grating. Throughout, despite eating people, she still loves Michael as her son, standing up to Nick, and at the end having a sort of redemption. Eh, so what's she dined upon human flesh? Haven't we all at some point in our lives? That was human meat. Randy Quaid plays the father. You probably recognize this guy from something or other. Perhaps Cousin Eddie from the Vacation franchise, or Boss Guy from Backshot Mountain. However, the true Joe Smoes in my audience will know him as the one and only Elijah C. Skuggs from Freaked. Honestly, one of the best performances of all time. Styrofoam cup. However, in this he gets to show his chops as a horror villain. And he does so spectacularly. 
While Mary is great at being that familiar and comforting motherly role, Randy gets to play this absolute intimidating son of a bitch. Everything this man says is threatening, yet he rarely says anything worth of suspicion. It's all in the delivery. His mannerisms and speeches are so unsettling, but equally subtle. You really like the dark, don't you, Michael? You can be yourself in the dark. But you know, there's one dark place that we have to be very careful in. Do you know where that is? It's kind of like the start of The Shining, where Jack isn't yet waving an axe around and screaming bloody murder, but there's something clearly off about him. A lot of the tension comes from watching his mild-mannered persona start to slip, leading to the climax where we finally see him flip his lid. I have to wonder what method this actor takes to play such an unhinged madman. Police media corruption. Ba-dum! Oh. There's a few other major characters like Mrs. Mountain Dew, the school psychologist who gets roasted by Michael for not being a real doctor, or their co-worker's family, the Zellners, who have an amazingly awkward dinner party together. The school's teacher, Miss Baxter, is also barely in the movie, but she sells her part. All the side characters are performed exactly as they need to be, none of them taking you out of the tone the movie's trying to build. The only real standouts are the child actors, which isn't surprising. It helps that Brian Midorsky doesn't say much because the weakest scenes come from his conversations with his school friend Sheila. Not because of the writing, but since these are kids who haven't really been in anything else. Michael works well enough when he's silently reacting to what's happening, helping him feel more like a weirdo kid. Funnily enough, Brian went on to a star-studded career as an accountant. Do you think his co-workers ever found out he was in a weird movie where Randy Quaid barbecued people? Either way, I wish him nothing but the best in his future endeavors. Maybe he could help finance Randy Quaid's foil lace bunker, protecting him from the lizard people's schizo rays. How do you impeach a president? who has helped create perhaps the greatest economy. Apart from the performances, what truly makes this movie work is the cinematography and soundtrack. There's these far empty shots conveying a creepy emptiness. I know what you're thinking. Oh, so liminal. This empty mall is so freaking scary, bro. But it really does add to the threatening atmosphere. Additionally, there's a lot of meat shots in the movie. What? No, not that kind of meat shots you were probably thinking of, you dirty-minded pig. What? Instead, there's these zoom-ins of the meat while they're cooking it makes it look really disturbing and off-putting. As a carnivore myself, the way the artery-shaped meat starts breathing like a lung makes me almost not want to eat my third Triple Baconator Deluxe from Wendy's. On second thought. It makes something so expected somehow creepy, it's very impressive. Those snossages are scarier than most of the ghouls I've ever seen. Even the ones in my walls who are always saying, Let me out, let me out, ha, <laughs> fat fucking chance, stupid ghost. Anyway, put them meats as an image in one of those Gmod next bots that people think are scarier than watching their parents slowly die on an operating table. You'll say eek, I tell ya. There's plenty of experimental, almost Raimi-esque camera work. The ending itself has the table on a lazy Susan for some odd reason. It's like the end of Hackers where they just spin the phone booth around to make it look more interesting. It's very dream-esque. It really does make you feel like you're in a child's nightmare, also Spider-Man. You, Spider-Man! I am a big enthusiast of long, droning soundtracks in my horror movies. You could take any footage. Even the Burger Andy Gets Left Behind video, sneak in the Eraserhead soundtrack, literal Sundance worthy, I guarantee it. So it really helps when the film's starting to devolve, the once cheery exterior starts to peel away, especially in the more avant-garde sequences. As briefly mentioned, in contrast, when the film is happy, it'll play Eddie Vallon's S Rock. I'm not sure the particular name of the specific Spanish genre of rock because I'm dog dumb stupid, but for reference it kinda sounds like the arrested development background music. Does that make any sense? I know what I'm talking about, alright? I went to college! More so than the Hitcher, there's barely any outright horror, like on-screen violence. The parents are chopping ten people up on screen every five minutes. The only really on-screen death is Miss Dew, where she gets her head putted across the field. Stupid ass Goomba, get out of the way! I guess it could have been cool to see more funny deaths, but I guess that would kind of cheapen it. Most of the horror comes from the mood, and I really like that about it. But I mean, come on. Randy could have said, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed, and then killed someone with his belt or something. Maybe he could run them over with his affordable Toyota Corolla. Just some ideas for the eventual sequel or soft reboot, Bob. Into the foxhole, soldier. Now, of course, this all has to mean something. This case must go further than Buddy Holly and Broad getting bored of Kirkland hot dogs and wanting to spice things up a little. Nothing's ever that simple, folks. Now, what do we know about 1950s America? Very conservative, right? None of those feelings or oppressed urges. That's all devil speak and hippy dippy baloney. Throughout the film, Michael is told to hide his inner self, to act normal and fit in. Nick wants desperately for Michael to see him as a strong role model, for him to grow up to be a proper man like he is. While Nick is very strict, 
There turns out to be many skeletons in his closet, with what he and his wife do behind closed doors. As you may have guessed, cannibalism in this movie mainly represents sex, sex being something taboo kept from the outside world. When Michael walks in on his parents going full WWE on the kitchen rug, he perceives it as them trying to eat each other, framing intercourse as this terrifying ritual, which it is. Now I know all you studs watching this video are about to have a whole lot of sex, but take it from me when I say it's bad news, brother. The parents' hidden indulgences are kept right under the surface, much like the wine they age in the cellar. Wine is alcohol, which is evil and demon juice. Just forget the J-Man turned a bunch of water into it. That was a mirage. The wine cellar fits into the greater theme of children doubting their parents' innocence. This escalates when Michael falls head over heels for this much taller girl in his class, which we've all been there, am I right or am I right? Anyway, Sheila wants to run away with Michael and do evil stuff like drink wine and talk about their feelings. Ew, yucky. Nick is strongly against this and reprimands Michael, and essentially tells his own son that he hates him. Been there. All of this is of course ironic because Nick isn't someone a kid should want to be. So you see, the worst part of the cannibalism was the hypocrisy. In conclusion, the film is about a boy growing to learn that his parents have secret indulgences and aren't as innocent as they act to be. Isn't deep analysis fun? Take it from that not at all insane man Freud where everything means sex all the time. Because when I see a Arby's meat mountain, that's all I'm thinking about. So we're at the end of the video now and I would really recommend this movie. It's very unique and oddly funny, it might just creep you out as well. In terms of the cannibal movie genre, it's certainly up there with the greats. But for my next video, I'll be reviewing your actual parents. Oh, Pa looks like he has a good pitching arm. Good for tossing the pig skin in the backyard. And Ma looks like you'd tell her anything. Very reliable eyes. But I can unfortunately just tell they're gonna get a divorce and it'll all be your fault. D-tier. <laughs> <laughs>